Hello and welcome to the ninth Cloudscape devlog. It's been four whole months since I last uploaded a devlog, so I know this is way overdue, but anyone following my social media would know that I ran a Kickstarter campaign for the game in June and it raised over $200,000 in total. The game's development is now fully funded and I'm extremely grateful for everyone's support. After making my last devlog video, I focused primarily on finishing the Kickstarter trailer and page, and then launching the Kickstarter and dealing with that for a full month as well. Now a month after the Kickstarter, I can finally post a new devlog, as I've spent the past few weeks working hard on the game's development. Because we hit all of the stretch goals, including local multiplayer, I needed to reassess where the game was at this point in development. I shifted all of my focus to getting a core foundation for multiplayer implemented, along with better controller support. I felt it was important to rework the existing game as soon as possible so that it can support multiplayer features moving forward instead of trying to go back and add multiplayer to a fully complete single player game. That would have been a massive headache and require months of coding changes. Instead, it has only taken me a few weeks to get the engine to work well with multiplayer support. So without any further delay, let's jump into what I've been working on. First up is controller support. This is something that I don't think a lot of indie games really think about until way later in development, but I think it's important to tackle this early on because there are many things that are influenced by playing the game with different controllers and control schemes. For starters, all of the user interface stuff needs to be designed with the idea that you can navigate the menus using a gamepad instead of a mouse and keyboard. The mouse and keyboard stuff is really easy when developing a game on PC because it's pretty much the default control setup in most games, and most UI is designed with this in mind. The problem is that some games have interfaces that are not very controller friendly. You get situations where players are dragging and dropping items around in inventory or clicking on various buttons, but with the controller you can't generally point and click stuff. Usually this is solved by just adding a crosshair or cursor in the game and using an extra analog stick to move it around like a mouse. This works alright for the most part, but feels more like it was just tacked on to make the interface work. With Cloudscape, I'm keeping all of this in mind so all of the interfaces in the game work well just using a gamepad, but also work as expected with a keyboard and mouse layout. Having this flexibility with controls will hopefully make the console versions of the game much better and the multiplayer aspects will also be improved as generally local multiplayer means playing with controllers. I'm not sure four people want to share a keyboard. So to solve all of this, I purchased the rewired package for Unity, which is basically a massive library of controllers and a whole system already created to handle controller support. This saves me a ton of work as I can just implement this package into my game instead of trying to build my own controller support from the ground up. So I've done just that and implemented rewired into Cloudscape. This supports hundreds of different controllers, including DualShock, Xbox, Switch, and tons of different PC gamepads. The last thing I need to do is add a remapping screen in the game that will allow players to choose a specific controller to use and also change all of the buttons to whatever bindings they prefer. As of now, I've tested the game with an 8-bit Do SNES gamepad and also a Sony DualShock controller, and those work great so far. With controller support implemented, I could then focus on the big task at hand, implementing local multiplayer. Because Cloudscape wasn't initially designed with multiplayer in mind, I wanted to make sure I started converting it to multiplayer support as soon as possible, so this means it got pushed to the front of the development to-do list. The first step I made was to create a player hub script which would be attached to a non-destructible object in the game. This hub basically handles all of the multiplayer joining and leaving functions and also is used as the target for the camera as the hub always spaces itself an equal distance from all players on screen. Next, I needed to figure out how I was going to handle letting players actually play the game together. I know most games take the approach where you need to create a brand new save file and select the multiplayer option, but I felt this was very limiting and wanted to try something a bit different. So the way multiplayer works in Cloudscape is that anyone can join any player in their save file at any time. So for example, if I started a new game as a solo player and played for a few hours, I could have a friend just press a button on a controller and they could create a new character and join right into my game. Each save file can hold up to four characters. You could even create new characters in your own solo player game file if you really wanted to do that. The idea is that players can come and go as they'd like. There's no need to force everyone to play at the same time or start the game together at the same time. For now, I think the system works great, but I'll have to do a lot more testing to see if it causes issues in the future. Adding in more players seems simple on the surface, but I actually had to do a lot of editing to code in order for the game to handle multiple instances of the player object. Since every single script was tied to only dealing with a single player, it was quite a daunting task to update pretty much everything to work with more than one player. Every script that dealt with player interactions needed to be changed to check which player I was supposed to interact with. 
This means I needed to give each player a unique ID so the game would know who was asking to do what or which player to examine. For instance, when a player hits a rock, I need to let the game know which player hit it because maybe that player has a stronger pickaxe or has some buff which increases the chance of extra item drops or any other number of possibilities. So whenever a player interacts with any aspect of the game, I grab their temporary ID and use that to work directly with the player. Having multiple players also means I need to have multiple inventories, multiple crafting recipe books, multiple skill tracking, and more. I spent a large chunk of time just setting up the game to allow for saving and loading four different sets of data. Getting the equipment and inventory to work with four players was particularly tricky. Lots of parts of the game are checking if the player has proper ingredients or tools or skill levels and all of that needs to look at the proper player data, inventory data, and skill data. I could no longer just point everything to one set of data and instead it to four different sets based on ID. There were a couple of other questions I needed to answer when setting up multiplayer. First up was what systems would players share and what systems would be separate. I definitely wanted players to each have their own inventory space and their own toolbars, but do all players need their own separate tasks list? The tasks in Cloudscape were just set up to guide players to progress through the game, so having each player need to do all of the tasks separately seemed sort of pointless. So for the task system, all players work towards the same tasks. For crafting recipes, however, I wanted players to need to earn their own recipes through leveling up their crafting skill. This means each player has their own list of unique recipes that they can craft. Meaning, if one player plays more than another, they will have access to recipes the other player doesn't have yet. I think this is an interesting way to go about it, as it makes more sense that the player more skilled in crafting would know how to craft more things. It creates a bit of friendly challenge between players as well. For skill rewards, I definitely wanted each player to have their own rewards for achieving things in the game. So each player gets their own skill page to level up. Since I've set up storage in the game to work globally, it made sense for players to actually share all storage. This means if one player puts a bunch of stones into a barrel, another player can use those stones to craft bricks from the crafting menu. I will, however, include a way to lock storage. This was already planned for single player because I wanted a way for players to store stuff they didn't want to be used in crafting recipes accidentally. This also means I could easily add a lock to the storage depending on the individual character, allowing players to store things away in their own private vault, so to speak. Aside from storage, items in players' backpacks are also exclusive to those players, so no worries about your friend crafting something and it taking resources out of your inventory, that won't happen. Moving on from inventory and things, I also needed to figure out some other crucial aspects of multiplayer. One being how to handle players using interface menus on a single screen, and how to deal with players entering a new scene. So for the interface, I decided that in single player mode, the overall heads up display will look as it already has, with the hearts and energy and toolbars centered at the bottom. But for multiplayer, I've come up with this more simplified arcade style interface. Here we get a more compact glance at health and energy, and only show the two equipped tools in the mini toolbar. This gives each player their own on-screen info, and it's even color-coded to help remove some confusion. I will later better color code other aspects of the multiplayer UI to work better with this as well. So now with the multiplayer interface, I needed to also start shifting elements like pin tasks and the alert messages. So that's being done now as well. I still need to fix the alert icons themselves as they are just floating in the bottom right corner now. And I also need to implement the time of day information at the top center of the screen. When a player wants to enter the pause screen to look at their inventory, craft, check out their skill reward progress, and save or quit the game, the game now lets that specific player use the interface while others wait. This is similar to games like Minecraft Dungeons, where players are sharing a screen space. The game pauses while any player goes into the menu, so no worries about the other players losing control for a moment. Once a player is in their inventory, they see the normal toolbar at the bottom and can arrange the items however they'd like. When they leave the inventory, they can cycle their tools using the shoulder buttons so they can quickly access up to 10 different items without having to keep going back into the inventory screen. Now to deal with players entering new scenes. So for example, when a player enters a cave on the island, the game actually loads in an entirely new scene. This means I either would need to use split screen to show two scenes for multiplayer, or just force warp all of the players to the new scene. I decided for now that when a player enters or exits a cave in multiplayer, all their players go with them. This actually was trickier to implement than expected, but eventually I got it all ironed out. A lot of players prefer to be doing their own thing and not have their friends interfering with that, but I think it adds a bit more groupthink to the game, and since this is a local multiplayer, you're going to be right there next to your buddy, so you can say, hey, let's go in this cave, and they agree, and then you just walk in all together. This makes it a true co-op experience instead of feeling more like two people playing a single player game together. The final aspect I needed to figure out was how combat, death, and players entering and exiting a multiplayer game would work. So for combat, it was a pretty simple change to just have monsters look for the closest player out of all existing players and just target that player. Player death was a bit trickier. Before when a player died in a single player game, the game would pause, they would play a death animation, and then right after they died they would be warped to limbo. 
However, this doesn't really work for multiplayer, as if one player dies, the other players are still alive, and I wouldn't want to warp them all to limbo, as that would hardly be fair. So instead, now in multiplayer, when one player dies, they simply play the death animation and lay on the ground. Monsters stop targeting the dead player, and the dead player just can't do anything for the time being. It's up to the remaining living players to either find a way to revive the dead player, or eventually die as well. If all players currently in the game have died, then the game will trigger the warp to limbo so that all players in the game will go there together. A tricky aspect to this is that because you can save the game and come back in as a single player, I needed to add in cases of a player loading in that died in multiplayer but didn't get warped to limbo. Now the player will still appear dead when loading in, but because they are alone, they will warp to limbo automatically as if it's now a single player experience. The catch here is now we have a player in limbo and the other living player is still in the main world. So how do we resolve this issue if a living player now wants to join a player who is in limbo? For the time being, I've decided that players can only join other players in multiplayer if they are all either living or dead. This means the player who is currently in limbo would need to revive before their living friend could join back into the game. It's a bit of a weird rule, but I think it makes sense when you really think about it, and again, I think it really ties into a cooperative experience. So that covers most of the multiplayer implementation. There are other things such as all of the hassle of having to set up a character creation menu inside the game, having to handle multiple player sounds, and a lot more. But that's all smaller stuff that was taken care of pretty quickly. For the game itself, I've also been adding in various little things here and there when I took breaks from multiplayer coding. I've added some new sound effects for walking and using tools. Footsteps sound differently depending on the surface you're walking on. I've also added music tracks to various areas of the game. My composer Samantha has been making these amazing tracks and it's really great to have one aspect of the game taken care of so I don't have to worry about that. So far we have a nice little title track, spring theme, cave music, pause menu music, and even a death and revive jingle. All of the music in this video was created by Samantha, so if you like it, be sure to check out her SoundCloud. I've linked it in the video description. Finally, I've done quite a bit of optimization in the game. It's stuff nobody will ever notice, but I've improved the performance of the game drastically over the past few weeks. As I was digging through pretty much every script to update it to multiplayer, I was noticing some parts of my code that weren't quite optimized. Generally, I might rush to get a piece of code done, so I don't think to do it in the most performant way. So it's nice to go back and change things that I didn't have time to worry about before. One major thing I fixed was the way the game was handling drawing all of the player's clothing attributes and sprites. Before I accidentally had the game constantly loading in the resources whenever the player changed direction. This was actually a huge performance hit, but for a while I didn't realize what I had done or what was causing it. After figuring it out, I've since changed it to only ever load the sprites in when the clothing actually changes. So all of that stuff pretty much gets loaded in once and then it's just utilized until it needs to be changed. It's silly stuff like that which can really impact the game's performance and these sorts of mistakes slip by pretty much every programmer at some point in time. It's always good to just stop new content and feature development for a day or so and really just look through your code for dumb stuff that you can quickly fix. In Unity, this means looking for performant heavy methods like the find method or get component or whenever you're declaring a new variable. Looking through any update functions for stuff that doesn't necessarily need to be constantly checked or updated, or looking at how you're loading in resources and even just simplifying code. I have a bad habit of typing out a condition like if bool equals true, and I type out the entire thing instead of just typing if bool. It isn't really going to impact performance, but to me it just looks cleaner to not sit there writing out true and false hundreds of times throughout my code. That about covers the development so far. Now that I have the core bits of multiplayer in place, I can start working more on new content and features for the game. I'm really excited to get into developing new stuff, so I'm looking forward to that for future devlogs. Thanks everyone for your support, and be sure to follow me on Twitter and join the Discord. Links are in the description. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to this channel. I'm hoping to get more devlogs out more frequently now that the Kickstarter is finished and all of my time is devoted to the development of the game instead of worrying about marketing and crowdfunding. On the topic of crowdfunding, I'm also contemplating making a video about the Cloudscape Kickstarter itself and what I learned from the experience. If that sounds interesting to you, just let me know in the comments, and if I get enough support for it, I'll make a video covering everything including some really good tips for making a successful Kickstarter. That's all for this video. As always, thanks for watching.